When you think about a bird, what do you think about? Now, most of us, I don't think, if you think bird, you are probably not thinking in your mind a penguin. You know, the cute little bird looks kind of like someone dressed in a, in a uh, tuxedo wobbling back and forth who swims. You don't usually think bird, first thing you think of is penguin. You don't, e neither do you think of ostrich. Most of us don't think of ostrich when we think of bird. You know, a bird that can't fly but can run. Most of us, when we think of birds, we think of those Little creatures that can fly around, the ability to fly all over the place. In fact, if you sit on my back porch in the morning, you will see all sorts of birds flying around. Blue jays and cardinals and robins and crows and sparrows and who knows what other kind of birds are out there. Those are the ones I can identify. There's probably many others out there. And I've noticed them as I sit there and watch them. I notice that they will fly around for a moment and then they'll land. The land on the roof or the land on a power line or the land on the ground, wherever they land, they'll sit there for a little bit and they'll look around and they'll do whatever the birds do. But as soon as they get a little spooked and they can get spooked at just about anything, whether it's something coming into the, the yard or whether there is a, a, a loud noise or something, all of a sudden, if they're spooked, they take off and they fly and they fly however far they fly. Sometimes they fly from my backyard over to the top of the church and they land over there and they sit there for a little bit. And they repeat that process over and over again. If they hear a noise, they're up, off again, they fly. They fly over to the next place. They fly over to the next place. From one place to another, every time they get a little spooked. Now, I don't know if this is true or not, but I get the sense that birds live in a world of peace or panic. I think birds live in a world of peace or panic. They, they land and they feel safe momentarily, and they're glad to be down landing, you know, chirping around, doing whatever birds do. But as soon as they think there's a predator around or they see something big or something unexpected happens, even if that is just a noise, all of a sudden they go into a panic and they fly off as quickly and as far as they need to to escape whatever is in the yard or whatever is near them. Now, you might be thinking, what does this have to do with anything? Well, the truth is, I think that's how a lot of us approach life, exactly like those birds. We enjoy peace as long as the circumstances allow it. You know, as long as things are going well in our lives, we enjoy peace. As long as we feel pretty good about our situation, we enjoy peace. But we are constantly scanning the horizon with an eye out for possible predators. And those predators may be real or they may be imaginary. In fact, I think lots of times we're looking around and all of these what if situations are going through our mind. What if they think this? What if they misunderstood me? What if I should have done it this way? What if this happens? And then all of a sudden when we see something frightening or feel like there's something frightening or imagine something frightening, whatever the case may be, we immediately attempt to escape to some kind of shelter. And we frantically keep on moving until we feel safe. Now we may not move from our house to some other house or anything like that, but we're constantly thinking of what we could do to make this situation better. You know what? I don't think that's how God plans for his children to live. I don't think that's the call of God for you and me to be constantly on the uh, uh, defensive, constantly ready to, to, to flee. I don't think that's what God wants. In fact, that's not the life that Jesus described at all. In Matthew 11, verse 28, Jesus says this. He says, come to me. Whoop, we skipped a verse. Come to me, all who are weary and carry heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. Jesus says, come to me and I will give you rest. Let me ask you a question. Is that how you feel you've been living the last few months of your life? In a state of rest? A state of peace? Is that, that, is that what you're feeling? How do we find this rest that Jesus promises? Well, for that, I think we need to look at our text this morning. It's Isaiah 40. If you have your Bible, you can turn to Isaiah 40. Now, I want to look at one verse to start off with, and we'll look at some other verses later. But Isaiah 40, verse 31, it says, But those who trust in the Lord will find new strength. They will soar high on wings like eagles. They will run and not grow weary. They will walk and not faint. 
Now, I don't know about you, but that's one of my favorite descriptions in the Bible. I love this text. If you don't know Isaiah 40, verse 31, you need to underline it. You need to highlight it. You need to memorize it. It needs to be a constant verse that you can turn to with your life. A verse that describes a strength that God gives us that never runs out, that never falls short. A strength that is described as having wings like an eagle. Now, I don't know about you, but we talked about birds a moment ago, but an eagle is a different kind of bird altogether. Uh, other birds flap and flap and flap to get where they're going, to panically find safety, to, to find shelter. They use a great deal of energy going here and there and everywhere. But that's not what an eagle does. Now, an eagle does have powerful wings, but they don't constantly use them. Did you know that an eagle can fly to over 10,000 feet in the air? Over 10,000. In fact, some have flown as high as 15,000 feet in the air. They fly so high that you and me with our naked eye cannot even see them. That's how high they can fly. Did you know that an eagle can fly at the speed of 60 miles an hour? In fact, some up to 100 miles an hour. Their wingspan can reach nearly 8 feet, which is almost two feet taller than I am, and they can travel vast distances. An eagle reaches these heights and, and flies these great distances by doing something unique. An, an eagle catches what we would call thermal updrafts. They're, they're these pockets of air that get heated by the sun because they're close to the ground, and all of a sudden they become like a column or, or a bubble, as it were, and they, they escape, and we all know that hot air rises, and so they, they head up into the sky, and that's what an eagle does. An eagle catches on one of those thermal drafts, and up and up and up they go, which means they use very little of their own energy. They're just floating along on this thermal column that God has provided. That's a picture that God paints of how our lives should be. That, that's the description that we just read. We are soaring on wings like eagles. We should be soaring on the updrafts that God provides for you and for me. Being able to cover great differences at great heights, leaning into the strength that God provides and leaning into the direction that God calls. So how do we achieve this, this level of rest, this level of success in the Lord? How do we soar on eagles' wings? How, how do we find this place where we can accomplish so much in the Lord's power? Well, our verse this morning, in the English Standard Version, or the King James Version, or the Revised Standard Version, they would all say that we need to wait upon the Lord. And then we will renew our strength. So they call on us to wait, all those versions. The New International Version and the Common English Bible, they, they tell us that we need to hope in the Lord. We need to hope in the Lord. So the, the, uh, the other three said that we need to wait on the Lord. Then the, the two that I just mentioned, they said we need to hope in the Lord. And then the New Living Translation, the, the Christian Standard Bible, and the New Century Version, they all say that we need to trust in the Lord. So we have three different descriptions of this word. We, we need to wait, or we need to hope, or we need to trust. And, you know, sometimes people kind of debate which is the best word. Is it waiting? Is it hoping? Is it trusting? And the truth is, all of those words are good, but the point is, what are all those words focused on? That's the point. The waiting and the hoping and the trusting are all focused on one place, and that place is the Lord. It all depends on how you and I see God, and not just see God, not just understand God, but how we live our lives based on who God is. That depends. That is the key to whether we can fly, soar on wings like eagles or not. Isaiah 40, this chapter, it begins the last section of Isaiah Chapters 40 through 66 were all written to comfort and encourage Jewish, the Jewish remnant, the, the refugees that were, that were held captive by Babylon but were, were going to move back into Jerusalem, into, uh, into their territory. In fact, 
They were held captive by Babylon 500 miles from Jerusalem. Now, 500 miles to us doesn't seem like that big a deal. We get in the car, drive 10 or 12 hours. We've made 500 miles. We're at our destination. But you start thinking about it. How many miles a day can you walk? Let's just say we walk 20 miles a day. Well, you can quickly figure out how long it takes you to go 500 miles. It takes you 25 days to go 500 miles. Now, some people probably walk it much quicker than that, and some people slower than that. But we're talking a long way from home. Now, these Israelites had survived the Assyrian invasion in the early 700s B.C., but the nation of Judah finally fell to the Babylonian Empire in 587 B.C. Jerusalem was reduced to a pile of rubble, and the people were overwhelmed by a sense of despair. They were taken off, and they were held captive for 70 years, or nearly 70 years, away from home. And Isaiah writes, by God's direction, to a group of people who, even after they were allowed to go back home, were faced with what would feel like to many insurmountable obstacles, a long, unforgiving journey, their homeland being occupied by the enemy, trying to rebuild a silly city that had been reduced to rubble without any kind of defenses. These people would have absolutely needed as much encouragement as possible. They would need to be reminded of how great God is. They would need to experience the unlimited strength that God is ready to pour out into their lives. And so Isaiah writes to them, who had been allowed to go back, he writes to them to bring them comfort, to bring them into a situation where they could have confidence in the Lord. And he writes to them, to a people that were a hundred years plus past his death. A hundred years plus past his death, he is writing into their situation. And to be quite honest, he is writing into the situation of a group of people that are two millennia past his death. You and me. What these refugees, what, these, what this remnant needed to hear then is exactly what we need to hear now. And that is that you and I can soar on eagles' wings. So Isaiah, in order to help them recognize and in order to help us recognize how great our God is, he asks them a series of rhetorical questions. But these questions, they speak to us. At least they should. And most of them are found in a single verse, Isaiah 40, verse 12. This is what it says. Who else has held the oceans in his hand? Who has measured off the heavens with his fingers? Who else knows the weight of the earth or has weighed the mountains and hills on a scale? I want to look at a couple of these questions this morning. And the first one is this. Who else has held the oceans in his hands? I want you to think about that for a moment. Who has held the oceans in his in his hand. I was preparing this sermon and I took my hand and I tried to cup it and make as deep a cup in my palm as I possibly could. And I went over and I grabbed a tablespoon out of the, out of the drawer. And I thought to myself, I wonder how many tablespoons I can get in the palm of my hand. And so I turned the water on and got a tablespoon and I started to pour it in. And to be quite honest, I couldn't get three in there. I couldn't get two in there. In fact, one tablespoon started to overflow the palm of my hand. A single tablespoon. Did you know that the Pacific Ocean covers over one quarter of the earth? In fact, the Pacific Ocean and, its, uh, and what it covers is about the same as all of the land about equals the same amount of coverage of the earth as all the land that is visible above the oceans. It has a depth that goes beyond 35,000 feet. Then you can add in the Atlantic Ocean, the Indian Ocean, the Southern Ocean, the Arctic Ocean, and then all the other seas, Mediterranean and all the other seas. And you have all of the oceans. And guess how much water is in all of these oceans? 321 million cubic miles of water in all those oceans. And they can be held in the palm of God's hand. Now because I know that it's hard for us to comprehend what a cubic mile of water is, 
I figured this up, and I hope I did my math right, and if I didn't, I apologize, but I figured it up. Watauga Lake, Watauga Lake is 0.0453 cubic miles of water, which means a single cubic mile of water could fill Watauga Lake 2,200 times plus. You could drain it and fill it 2,200 times with a single cubic mile of water. And God holds 321 million cubic miles of water in the palm of his hand. Like it's nothing. Or another question he asks, who has measured off heavens, the heavens with his fingers? I know I've mentioned this before, but in 2004, scientists pointed the Hubble telescope scope at a blank looking patch of the sky near the Orion constellation. They kept that telescope pointed at that place for 11 days. That place in the sky is about the size of a piece of sand. If you held it out at the end of your arm, that's how big it was that they pointed their telescope at. And in that tiny patch of sky over those 11 days, they discovered over 10,000 galaxies. Now, not too long ago, astronomers thought that there were 100 billion galaxies in the universe. That number jumped because of the Hubble telescope, and they began to believe there were 200 billion galaxies in the universe. And today, to be quite honest, some scientists believe that there could be as many as 500 billion galaxies in the universe. And each of those galaxies, to be quite honest with you, holds hundreds of millions of stars. And I want you to understand this. I want you to just try to comprehend this, try to wrap your mind around it. But Jesus made all of them, every single one. In fact, in verse 26, this is what we're told. Isaiah 40, verse 26, look up into the heavens. Who created all the stars? He brings them out like an army, one after another, calling each by its name. Because of his great power and incomparable strength, not a single one is missing. Think about that. He not only measures the universe by the span of his fingers. I don't know about you. Mine's maybe nine inches. Whole universe span and span of God's fingers. But he knows every single star by name. Can, can you imagine the immense power that it takes to do that, to know that, to understand all that? But Isaiah goes on, goes on, he says, who else knows the weight of the earth? And he adds in mountains and all these other things. I started to think about that for a moment. Have you ever lifted a five-gallon bucket filled with sand? Ever lifted a five-gallon bucket filled with sand? Now, take a five-gallon bucket filled with sand on one side of your body and another five-gallon bucket of sand on the other side of your body and pick them up and start carrying them. How far do you think you can carry those two five-gallon buckets full of sand? By the way, if you want a little demonstration, there is a bucket of sand out there that we use to hold up one of the tent uh, things because of, we can't stake right there. Go pick it up and carry it around for a moment. Just see how heavy that is. Now imagine taking five-gallon buckets and trying to relocate the entire Sahara Desert. Or like, let's take that down a notch. Let's just go to Kitty Hawk and let's try to move the dunes of Kitty Hawk. What do you think? Or let's do something a little closer to home. What about moving a single peak of the Appalachian Mountains? Imagine trying to do that. And yet God carries the whole earth all mountains, all of it in a bowl. At least that's how the New Century Version describes it. Verse 12, who has used a bowl, talking about God, to measure the dust of the earth and scales to weigh the mountains and the hills? In fact, verse 15 kind of takes it one step farther. Verse 15 goes on to say, No, for all the nations of the world are but a drop in the bucket. They are nothing more than dust on the scales. He picks up the whole earth as though it were a grain of sand. The entire earth to God is a grain of sand. By the way, all the nations of the world are like a drop in the bucket. Do you know there are like 200 nations in the world right now? 
200 nations. Think about all the trouble these 200 nations are causing right now. How much problems they can get into, and yet God, they, that doesn't even compare to how great and mighty and powerful our God is. And so Isaiah continues to remind them and continues to remind them and continues to remind them of the God that they serve. In fact, verse 28, he goes on and he says this, verse 28 of our text. <laughs> Maybe it's not on there. Let me read it to you. Have you not heard? Have you never understood? The Lord is an everlasting God, the creator of all the earth. He never grows weak or weary. No one can measure the depths of his understanding. Have you never heard? Have you never understood? Isaiah is talking to them. And by the way, he's talking to us. Have you never heard? Have you never understood? God is eternal. Do you not get that? He, is, he is, has no beginning. He, he has no end. Psalm 90 verse 2 describes it like this. Before the mountains were born and before, before you created the earth and the world, you are God. You have always been and you will always be. In Revelation, as they're praising God, it says each of these four living creatures had six wings and was covered all over with eyes inside and out. Day and night, they never stopped saying, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. He was, he is, and he is coming. God is eternal. There is no end to God. There's no beginning to God. God always is. God, it describes, never gets fatigued. He never gets tired. He never gets weary. He never has to rest. He never sleeps. It continues, God knows everything. God knows everything. Did you know God does not need to learn anything? There's no learning curve with God. God doesn't walk into a situation and say, well, let me think about this for a minute. God is the source of all truth and all knowledge. It comes from him. He didn't need to figure it out. Romans 11, verses 33 through 36. Yes, God's riches are very great and his wisdom and knowledge have no end. No one can, can explain the things God decides or understands his ways. As the scripture says, who has known the mind of the Lord or, or who has been able to give him advice? No one has ever been given God anything that he must pay back. Yes, God made all things and everything continues through him and for him. To him be the glory forever. Amen. I don't know if you figured it out yet or not, but Isaiah essentially is looking at them and he's looking at us and he's asking us a question. Do you still not get it? That's the question. Do you still not get it? Are you still so dense that you don't realize that you are following the all-powerful, all-knowing, always alert, always there for you, God? So when God tells us in his word that if we trust in him, that if we wait in him, that we've, if we hope in him, that we will soar high on eagles' wings, that we will never grow weary or faint, then that should change everything because that is what God proclaims. It isn't about what we can do. It is about what God can do through us and for us. There's a huge difference there. And that's what Isaiah is trying to remind us of. You serve the almighty, all-powerful, all-knowing, always-present God. What are you fearing about? What are you fretful for? The meaning of the Hebrew word new or renew, depending on what version you're looking at, is more accurately translated exchange. Essentially, God says they exchange their fleeting mortal strength for God's unlimited, always available, never exhaustible strength and power. To try to illustrate this, suppose you have a, a, a lawnmower and the lawnmower is not running the way you would like it to run. It's not cutting grass as good as it should. And so you think to yourself, well, I'm going to do some little upgrades on this lawnmower. So I'm going to change the spark plugs. I'm going to, I'm going to put on new spark plug wires. I'm going to clean it as best I can. I'm going to put new bearings in there. I'm going to grease everything. I'm going to put new blades on this lawnmower. Get a new battery so it starts up right as soon as I hit the, hit the key. And to be quite honest, after you do all those things, you do experience an increase in the power and performance 
of the lawnmower. It does do better. It cuts grass better. All of a sudden, it's doing a little bit better, but it's just an incremental increase. It's not mind-blowing. But what if you did what I heard a man did quite some time ago to his lawnmower? This man's lawnmower didn't have the power he wanted, and so he took this long-frame garden tractor and he removed the engine altogether. And what he put on there was a 350 cubic inch, inch Chevy V8 on his lawnmower. And he coupled that to an eight inch Dodge rear end. And he made his lawnmower a machine that could cut some grass. In fact, it was so powerful, so impressive, that a man who was driving by, who saw this mega machine out there in the yard doing its work, stopped the car, walked up to the owner of this lawnmower and wrote him a check that very moment on the spot so he could have this machine that this man had built. Now, I want you to understand, that is what I would call a strength transplant, not merely an upgrade. That, that's something completely different. And that's exactly what God is offering you and me. When we're weak, we don't need an upgrade of strength. We need a transplant. And that's what God provides. God says, you transfer your trust completely on me. You put your hope in me. You look to me for everything. You allow my unlimited strength to work in you. And it will not only flow and make things better, it will change them completely. God wants us to rely on his spiritual power, his strength, rather than us pulling ourselves up by our own bootstraps. You know, it's one thing for us to call God Almighty, but it is another thing completely to live as, God, as if God is almighty. One of my favorite texts is found in Ephesians chapter 3, verse 20. It's in the midst of a prayer. And this is what this little verse says. With God's power working in us, God can do much, much more than anything we can ask or imagine. That's what Isaiah is reminding them about. That's what Isaiah is reminding us about. God has called you and me to live a life where we are catching the updrafts of his strength. This has nothing to do with whether or not life will be hard or not. To be quite honest, I'm going to guarantee you something this morning. Life will be hard. This has, this has everything to do with whether or not we recognize and remain trusting and energized for the service of the Lord regardless of the obstacles that are set before us. The only way you soar on eagle's wings is if you recognize how great and mighty and powerful God is and you step out with him wherever he calls you. Did you know that eagles love the storms? Eagles love storms. You know why? Because in the midst of the storm, there are these raging winds, and these raging winds have the ability to lift an eagle up higher than the clouds. They embrace the storm. They, they love the storm. They fly into the storm so that they can be lifted up to higher than the clouds so they can glide on the strength of the storm and its winds. And to be quite honest, you and I, we are in the midst of a storm in our world. And the truth is we are not supposed to be fleeing the storm. We're supposed to be flying into the storm so that God can lift us up on his mighty strength and help us, use us, enable us to lift others up with his mighty strength and soar. So let me ask you this morning, are you just surviving or are you soaring with the Lord? Which is it? Which is it? Are you surviving or are you soaring? Because God has called us to soar and a life that soars is a life that is completely different. 
It's a life that is dependent on the Lord. It is a life that brings others with it. It is a life that holds people up, pulls people up out of the issues of strife and struggle that this world is constantly throwing at us. It is a life that offers hope. It is a life that is one that is seen and longed for. Is that your life? And the strength of God, is that your life? God has called us to soar on eagles' wings. And my challenge to you and to me is for us to trust the Lord and jump in to the updraft that is his strength. I will be, I will be, I will be strength for the journey. I will be. I will be, I will be strength for the journey.